Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. I know he's good. I know I'm good. We're going to keep moving on. Today, we're doing an episode about our favorite topic, Tether. Um, lately, Tether has, well, been making a lot of noise. Uh, with all of this contagion going on, with all of these companies getting liquidated and going bankrupt, Tether has been talking about how they're totally solvent, how they're totally fine. Um, and we want to talk about a few things. We want to talk about their loan to Celsius that they supposedly over collateralized by roughly 30%. Um, we want to talk about some discrepancies that we've seen in their transparency reports, um, their attestations. And we want to talk about a recent interview that the group did, that Mr. Paolo Arduino did on CNBC Tech Check with Deirdre Bosa. So we're going to link to that. You should watch the whole interview. It's only seven minutes or so, eight minutes, something like that. But we're going to talk about these three things just to kind of review where Tether is at, what the risks remain to be, and what we expect to see, I guess, kind of. Uh, nothing crazy, but a, a proper review. So, so let's get started with the the Celsius loan and liquidation process. So, um, Bennett, can you go ahead and, and get us into that? Well, sure. Let's start with the most basic parts. Tether was the lead equity investor in Celsius's Series A, and so is a part owner of Celsius. Besides this, we knew from the past and have talked about before on this show how Tether extended secured loans to various other crypto companies, including Celsius. The way these would work appears to be that Celsius, Babel Finance, Nexo, whoever would put up about, say, $1.3 billion worth of Bitcoin, hand it over to Tether, and Tether would then extend them a loan of about a billion Tethers at, I think it was like a 6% interest rate or something, is what Mashinsky said the loan from Tether was. And then, yeah, that was the loan. What ended up happening is when Celsius was having all of these liquidity issues, they were unable to post additional collateral to Tether, and so Tether, to protect the value of their reserves, which this loan was a part of, supposedly was able to liquidate the collateral above the face value of the loan and still return some of it to Celsius. This liquidation by Tether may have been what ended up putting some of Celsius's other loans and positions into danger. I think it was during the Contagion episode, but it might have been when Dirty Bubble Media was on. We talked about how Tether liquidating this loan to Celsius and selling this $1.3 billion worth of Bitcoin into the market may have been one of the things that was really pushing down the price of Bitcoin during that period where Celsius shut off withdrawals and ended up threatening their maker DAO position. Because people remembered during that period Celsius spent a lot of that threat of having their MakerDAO loan liquidated, and that was a wrapped Bitcoin position. I know we've discussed it before, but can you just go over what MakerDAO is so that everybody is caught up here? Sure. MakerDAO is a stablecoin that's basically based entirely around the idea of these same kind of secured loans that Tether is giving people. You over collateralize a position with cryptocurrency. So in Celsius's case, they were using wrapped Bitcoin here. And so they put up about the same as what Tether required, about 30% over. And then you get extended a loan in DAI, which is a stablecoin effectively collateralized by these loans. And then you can use that as a stablecoin. Often it's used to effectively lever up in the cryptocurrency system, right? You take the crypto you own, you put it up as collateral so you can keep your exposure to that. You get this new stablecoin, in this case, basically the same, whether it's Tether or DAI. You use that to purchase more crypto or to do other crypto trading and things like that. And in doing so effectively, increase your exposure as a whole by increasing the leverage in the system. So Tether supposedly liquidated their loan and Celsius got in trouble because of it. Well, I think when most people consider loans, now there's the obvious ones that probably everyone is familiar with is a, a mortgage, which are generally over collateralized. Um, so you'll put down however much the home is worth. Let's say the home is worth a uh, million dollars. You would put down 10, 20 percent, something like that. And then the bank would extend the rest of the value of that home to you with the understanding being that you're going to make payments on that for the remainder of the, it could be 15 years, 30 years, who knows. You're going to pay that out. And if you don't, if you stop paying, they're going to take your house from you. And so now they have over collateralized that loan. But normally, 
loans are not necessarily over collateralized. If we're talking about business loans, if we're talking about personal loans, if we're talking about a lot of different loans, they're not actually over collateralized. They're collateralized to some degree, right? When I think of most loans, either it's unsecured or the individual genuinely does not have the capital necessary to over collateralize a loan. So when you're talking to me about all of this over collateralization, the only other example in my head where over collateralization is the norm, which is like margin trading, you know, leverage trading, options trading, that kind of thing. It's like, oh, this is these are prime examples of when you need to be over collateralized because the broker might need to call it in and take everything. And so it sounds to me like you're suggesting that's what this over collateralization is all about. It's all about levering up, levering up. Yes. So I think you made a couple of points that I'm going to dissect a little bit. Like a revolving line of credit extended to a business is not necessarily collateralized, but in many cases will be by, for example, partial ownership, some amount of equity in that business itself. And we're saying over collateralized, but we really shouldn't be. And we talked about this back when Francis Coppola was on, back at like episode 20. The Bank of International Settlements basically says that cryptocurrency is too volatile to be used as loan collateral because you can't be confident that you're going to be able to liquidate it, right? And like we've seen with a whole bunch of these loan platforms that were exposed to three hours capital and all these other ones that many of them, despite the loan initially appearing adequately collateralized, when they went to liquidate, there was not adequate liquidity for that loan to actually be adequately collateralized. That even appears to be what's going on with the CoinFlex Roger Ver dispute, right? Is that when they finally liquidated the collateral in his futures account, they ended up with a deficit because they had extended too much to him effectively. And so we're saying over collateralized, but these are not really over collateralized. They're collateralized, hopefully. The Bank of International Settlements would say no, but we'll say they are for this. And the issue with crypto collateralized loans, like we kind of talked about in our contagion issue, is what you're leading into now, is that it is generally used as a way of levering up. It's trying to maintain exposure to your crypto asset and still get an asset you can use to continue to trade, interact, and increase your exposure to the crypto ecosystem. And I think the other example that we do commonly see that looks kind of similar to this is borrowing against your stocks. Right. Like we've seen a lot of Elon Musk, for example, put up a bunch of Tesla stock as collateral, have a bank extend him a loan. And then that is kind of vaguely similar to what we see a lot of these cryptocurrency places doing. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the actual. So Tether released a statement on July 8th. And, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I am going to read a part of it. We'll, we'll link to it in case you want to feel the full wrath of Tether. And there's a couple weird things in this statement to me. But first, the Tether loan that was taken out by Celsius was an over collateralized loan denominated in Bitcoin at 130 plus percent. And the decision to liquidate the collateral to cover the loan was a part of the original terms of the agreement between the two entities and reconfirmed in writing before the start of the liquidation event. This process was carried out in a way to minimize as much possible any, as much possible any impact on the markets. And in fact, once the loan was covered, Tether returned the remaining part to Celsius as per its agreement. Okay, if I have taken out a short position or a margin loan to buy stock and the bank margin calls me, they take it. They don't send anything back. They take my collateral. That loan is done. And I've been liquidated. Never will the brokerage send me anything back. Help me understand why they're sending capital back after they've liquidated a company. I mean, presumably because it's part of the written agreement they have with Celsius, right? Is that after the liquidation, since presumably like their maximum loan to value ratio is at a point well above one to one, they probably include in the agreement that when the liquidation is completed, Tether will send the remainder to Celsius. I don't think that part's particularly unbelievable here. But there's a more troubling aspect of this loan that I think we need to touch on here. And this kind of goes back to Tether was one of the lead investors in Celsius. Tether owns a portion of Celsius. Celsius used customer deposits, these Bitcoin, to get this loan extended in Tether. And when the time came, Tether sold customer deposits from a company they own a part of into the market and just liquidated them. 
protecting Tether's reserves, but selling the customer deposits of a company that Tether partially owns. That is a morally challenging position to be in. And I think that's a detail that hasn't gotten as much attention yet in this story, is that like, the fact that Tether extended the loan in the first place and was willing to basically take these customer deposits from Celsius and do this and give them this loan that they knew could be liquidated itself has problems. But then that they actually did liquidate it and sell these customer Bitcoins that had been extended to them by Celsius feels real bad. Morally, that's pretty uh, ambiguous. But I would say from a business perspective, I am like, OK, well, obviously they're going to do that. I before we move on from this, I do have a couple of other thoughts on this loan before this episode comes out. Another episode we recorded just a couple days ago will be out in which we discuss a lawsuit filed by Jason Stone against Celsius. In it, he alleges the original loan from Tether to Celsius was effectively a bailout for Celsius because they had ended up insolvent by not appropriately accounting for user funds and using user funds to trade. This is not the only time Tether has been accused of doing this. In December of 2020, Decrypt ran an article discussing a whistleblower allegation about Babel Finance, another crypto lending platform at the time that was really popular in China. This platform had supposedly taken customer deposits, had begun trying to lever up using them to trade and pay out higher yields. When they ended up in a position with inadequate liquidity, Tether stepped in, bailed them out, and kept them going. And I think this kind of points to something we've discussed for years at this point, which is that Tether is not just a dollar peg token. Tether is not just its market cap. Tether is like this integral and insidious part of the crypto industry that gets in and is connected to so many other pieces. So we're talking about all this kind of insectual stuff, all of this weird backing, uh, secured loans. And Paolo went on with Deirdre, and she asked a lot of these questions directly to him. Let's start talking about some of the main points that stuck out the most to us. Where do we want to start? I would be nervous going on CNBC, right? Like, people get nervous going on major network TV. Let's, let's not read too much into his tone and focus more on, like, his words. Let's start at one specific place. I got a starting point. Is a year ago, when Stu and Paolo went on, Stu said when D asked for the timeline, that the audit would be coming in months and not years. When Paolo was recently on, he was asked follow-up questions about that audit. He said that they currently had a Big 12 auditor performing the audit, which is not a term that... <laughs> Everyone knows this. There are four big auditing firms. It is called the Big Four. It used to be the Big Five. It used to be the Big Eight. There have been different moments in time where there were more of these auditors than now. But right now, it's four of them. It's Ernst & Young. It's KPMG. It's Deloitte and Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, so those are your big four. Big 12 is not a fucking thing. It's not a real fucking thing. It's totally made up. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this, and I'm so glad Deirdre called this out because he's been repeating it all over the place. He's saying, we've got a, a, a big 12 auditor. We've got a top 12 auditor. There isn't such a thing. There's no such thing. Stop Listen, saying that. I, I'm sure there is some list that this auditor was ranked number 12 on, and that's what Who they're Who fucking to. cares? I don't know where the list is, but it probably exists. So yeah, they said they hired a big 12 auditor, which first of all, let's pause for a second. Even among the big four auditors, there is a wide range of quality and diligence among their franchises, right? Like the U.S. domiciled ones, which still have quite a few ethical and other problems. This is it. Their so franchises... Important. So important because she asked if they reached yes. out to the big four and his response wasn't, yes, we did. His response was, yes, in certain jurisdictions. Yes. Yeah. And so even across the like different jurisdictions, you'll see a wide variance in the diligence and quality of the audit. The China hustle, which we've talked about before, kind of gets into how the big four's Chinese franchises were auditing numbers that were completely untethered from reality. Paulo says that they discussed with the big four, but did not like ever engage with the big four. The big four are not auditing Tether in any jurisdiction. They're scared. They're scared of auditing cryptocurrencies. Yeah. 
That's that was the claim. They're scared of auditing cryptocurrency companies. Not not they're scared of auditing Tether in particular, which is a, probably a lot closer to the truth. But they're scared of auditing cryptocurrencies in general, which again Deirdre paused on and said, "Sorry, what did you say? They're scared?" <laughs> and he was like, and, "Yeah, and I yeah, think yeah." It's quite and you're like, "Okay." That many auditors were afraid of the reputation risk of working for Tether, and especially of signing off on their current books. But like, that's another important thing to remember: is they're right. saying top twelve which is already not a thing. We're already eight <laughs> below what people actually consider the top. And depending on what jurisdiction that top 12 is operating in, there can still be a massive variation, even for that own right. auditor among their different franchises, right? Like if, for example, their London office is generally considered pretty passable, their, for example, Cayman Islands office might not have that same reputation, right. hypothetically. Just saying. Not that I'm suggesting that, but... They have a top 12 auditor, but they can't tell us who it is. Because if they tell us, Cass and I are going to call them and annoy the auditor. And then the auditor will stop working for Tether. Which, by the way, I, I want to make this clear. And I don't know, <laughs> maybe, Bennett, you have a different – maybe you have a different experience. I never have called any of Tether's auditors. Never in my life. I've never planned – I've never planned – No, but planned I imagine to. other journalists have. Like, as part of writing articles back when Friedman was supposedly auditing them, I imagine journalists have called the auditor to ask, are you performing an audit? And I imagine um, that's a normal thing that auditors have to deal with is journalists or other people calling and asking about a company. It seems well, like I, a pretty I, normal part of, of the job. I imagine most auditing firms are not going to tell people a bunch of details over the phone. The most they'll probably do, if it's already public knowledge, is go, yes, we can confirm so-and-so is one of our clients, but we don't discuss ongoing engagements beyond that, right? It's not like the auditors are going to suddenly start going over the phone to a journalist. Oh, yes, we're auditing them. They have this much of this security, this much of this security thing. <laughs> Yes, here's the audit. So, it's right in front yeah, of me. Tether, Tether <laughs> yeah. is claiming that the reason they can't tell us who's doing the audit is because the auditor will no longer do it if people know who's doing it. <sighs> Which is like, th this is Bitfinex and Tether's banking all over again. We right. can't tell you where we bank because if we tell you where we bank, the bank accounts will get shut down. Right. And I didn't, I didn't let you get to the last part of this, which is funny to me, um, that after saying, you know, they're getting audited, they're definitely, they're ready, they're all lined up and it's ready to get done now, uh, this, this audit from a big well, 12 it, auditor. Wh what's the... Which means they must know who the auditor is, right? Like if they're describing them as Big 12, they must exist and be top 12 on a list right. somewhere. So they, it, it has to like exist as an engagement or they're just flat out right. lying. Right. Uh, so, okay, fine. They've engaged with this auditor. But a year ago, they said it was a few months away. And this time, when asked uh, if, if this would be a few months away, years, Paolo said, I don't know. I, I just don't I don't know what to say about this. It's the blind leading the blind uh, over there at Tether. I don't I don't know how you go on national television, international television, and you're not prepared to answer pretty simple questions like that, you know? Um, well, and like what keeps your token tethered to the dollar? <laughs> and 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 that's so we'll move on from the interview because I think we touched on kind of the most. I, is there another part that you think particularly sticks out to you before we move on? No, not particularly. The The one part that I do want to draw attention to is that Deirdre asked Paolo if their asset management was handled by an external firm that managed their reserves for them. And Paolo said no, it was entirely internal. So that means our friend Silvio Di Stefano, whose name Tether is suing to keep a secret, whoops, <laughs> must be managing an incredible team of traders who pull off miraculous stunts on a daily basis. And this gets us into finally the last part of uh, our update, which is that now, uh, it, again, you can listen to all of our old episodes about Tether. I think we've done four or five at this point. Um, so quite a few episodes about them specifically. And there's a couple hours worth of listening there. But lately, we've noticed in their transparency their attestations that were forced upon them, by the way. These aren't, they're not doing this willingly. They don't like doing it. It was, they are forced to quarterly do attestations that they have to show to the public. Don't get confused. Don't let them pretend they're doing this to be the kings of unrivaled transparency. They're doing it because the New York Attorney General said, if you don't do this, you're fucking toast, bros. Uh, so they decided to, you know, play by the rules, at least in that sense. But what we've noticed is that their assets, and, and we're not the only ones who have noticed this, uh, Patrick McKenzie, 
who you can follow at patio, P-A-T-I-O, 1111 on Twitter. Patrick McKenzie has repeatedly pointed out that their assets over liabilities are essentially like less than 1%. If you're a stablecoin, if your assets over liabilities dip below like one, if you if you get below a dollar of assets over liabilities, if you go to zero um, or negative one, that makes you insolvent. The interesting part here is that Tether has gone from a market cap of roughly 80 billion to 66 billion. Tether has apparently sold all of their commercial paper for some reason. I mean, it was all great. Com- Apologies. They've sold a bunch of their commercial paper, which they shouldn't even be doing because it was such perfect, beautiful commercial paper. And it was hardly even a risk, they said. Um, but to get critics like us to shut up, apparently, just because of people like us, they're going to move away from this uh, this really beautiful commercial paper that's giving them this great yield. And they're going to move it all into U.S. treasuries. So they're selling off all of this essentially riskier asset class with higher yield and selling it into a lower yielding, less risky asset class. Meanwhile, their market cap is dropping precipitously. Also, let's not forget, they have equity in Celsius, which has now pretty much gone belly up. I think we can all agree. It seems like it's going to go bankrupt here. So they have equity in companies going bust. They've lent out to 3AC. They've lent out to Celsius. They've lent out to X, Y, and Z company that's probably dead in the water already. And yet, and yet, this, this DiStefano guy has managed to keep their assets over liabilities almost exactly the same throughout all of this. It's unreal. It's unbelievable. It is amazing. Amazing. It is literally unbelievable. You're right. And there's a few different things here. There should be a cost for them rolling these assets, right? The commercial paper they've rolled over, which we can see because the duration on the attestation suggests that they are still purchasing new commercial paper. They're rolling some portion of it and not just taking the cash and moving it into treasuries. So there's a cost associated with that. There's also the changing rates environment that has been occurring like underneath the bonds, commercial paper, and treasuries they own. As rates have gone up, the face value of the things they own we would expect would go down, and their long-term position will improve as they roll into the new higher yielding stuff because their overall yield will go up. But the stuff they're holding as the rates go, its face value goes down, and they're in potentially a more challenging position to roll it. And so, like, there's several of these factors that contribute to... And like the bond market has gotten hammered because of the rising rates and a bond ETFs back part of Tether. You mentioned Celsius equity, infinite uh, fleet equity from Samson Mao's little game. You mentioned the loans to Celsius. We don't actually know if they've loaned to 3AC. We just know 3AC was getting a bunch of tethers issued to them. We do know that they had, in the past at least, issued loans to Babel Finance, which is another lending platform that shut off withdrawals. And we have not heard that Tether liquidated that loan. Um... And so, like, you're right, there's a bunch of things in here that seem like we would expect their value to sometimes change. Yet, Tether, who says they update the transparency page every single day, shows basically the exact same shareholder capital cushion. This isn't the only problem with Tether's transparency page, by the way. We've been pointing out for years, and one of our auditor friends also pointed this out for years, that the number of quarantine tethers described on the tether transparency page does not match the number on the blockchain. I've added up the ones on the Omni blockchain before, and it is millions more than they list on their transparency page, which gets at something we discussed back when we talked about the Tether CFTC settlement, right? Which revealed that Tether's record keeping was inadequate. They were not keeping good track of their reserves. They were not keeping careful track of the tethers issued and redeemed against those reserves. And so Tether has a long history of inadequate bookkeeping, of suspicious numbers on these statements. And I think that kind of takes us back to why they've had so much trouble finding an auditor. And like, they had hired an auditor who supposedly had agreed to do a full financial audit way back in 2017, right? They had announced to the world the name of the auditor. Then, when they separated from the auditor, their excuse was not that people were calling this auditor and annoying them. Their excuse was this auditor wanted to do excruciatingly detailed procedures. And because of that, we weren't going to go forward with it. That's how an audit works, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's how a fucking audit works, guys. I don't know what to tell you. When you get audited, 
they go through your financials. And like excruciatingly, especially if you're, you know, you're a bank with a dollar derivative essentially. Yeah. Like if that's your if that is your company, yeah, expect a rough audit to see what you're doing with your dollar derivative. I Yeah, and j- well just to double down on that last year when they went on Deirdre's show and promised the audit, Stu ended up tweeting out something that was very strange which said the audit would be coming soon that the 2018 fiscal year audit would be coming first and that there would be no pineapple pizza in their statements. Um, Which is a really weird statement for several reasons. One, the first auditor they engaged was for the 2017 financial year, not 2018. During 2018, they were engaging in a series of conflicted transactions with Bitfinex involving hundreds of millions of dollars moving between the two companies without documentation or contracts. And, like, why in 2021 were they promising that the first thing they were going to provide was the audit for 2018? And then finally, why was that promised a year ago and now they're going on TV and saying there's no timeline and they can't even tell us who the auditor is? What happened to whoever was supposedly doing the 2018 audit a year ago? Why is that a question that they can't answer? Yeah. Why, why, why 2018? Why? <sighs> I'm going mad. Yeah, well, for all this posturing that they consistently do, this is not new to us. We've been following this space long enough that we've seen them do this a million times before. But I do want to say this, that I think they have the same cocky bullshit attitude as Suzu at 3AC, Kyle Davies at 3AC, Alex Mashinsky at Celsius. These people are broke now and no one knows where they are. No one knows what's going on with them. Nobody's heard from these people in weeks because as cocky and annoying as they were, they lost it all real fast and that cocky attitude is gone. They're gone. And who knows? Maybe Tether is being cocky because they're totally up to snuff and they're going to prove us so wrong with all these beautiful audits from a big 12 auditor. I don't think so. I just don't believe them anymore. They have lied to us about 10 times too many times for me to uh, take a single word they say as honest. They've, they have, if nothing else, proven that they won't be honest unless a government agency forces them to be slightly transparent. They're not going to tell you the truth. Don't believe their lies, as my boy in Memento would say. Um, So uh, I... I think that's I wanted to do an update simply because they're posturing a lot lately. They're they're doing press releases, they're going on TV, they're doing the same old song and dance, but it works sometimes and I just want to make sure people are holding the same space of skepticism that they were holding before they started their song and dance again. Yeah. Tether is a corporation full of liars and is a corporation that itself lies. It's simple. I mean, if corporations are people, then there you go. Um I guess we should take down our Tether donation page. We've been accepting donations in Tether for uh, Tron, Tether Ethereum, Tether Solana, Tether on uh, on Bitcoin Cash. We only do those ones, though. Uh, We don't do it on uh, any of the other chains. Instead of donating, I guess you can hit the like or subscribe button. And um, thanks for joining us. 